Okay, hello, and welcome to this presentation on reinventing CSS in JS, the story of stitches. My name is Christian Alfoni. I work at Code Sandbox, and typically I concern myself with state management. And I was supposed to talk about state management today, but I felt I had a more important story to talk about. Um, so uh, please forgive me, forgive me that. Um, it's just that I have all these ideas all the time, and I'm uh, even though I work with like state management in Overmind and and Cerebral, I'm like concerned with everything. Um, like if I see something that annoys me or doesn't work, or I feel inspired, I kind of have to dive into it. Dive into it. Uh, so what we're going to talk about today is not I'm I'm not going to like sell you stitches uh, or anything like that. I just want to talk about how ideas turns into concepts through iterations and what inspirations um, you can have um, doing that and also what collaborations ties into that and basically give an example of a journey of how an idea can turn into uh, a concept. Uh, so. Uh, typically, where I get kind of my ideas and inspirations from is on my Twitter feed. Like stuff pop up there all the time. Um, um, not too long ago, uh, there was a lot about Tailwind CSS, and I'm, I like I'd heard about Tailwind CSS, but I never looked into it. But since there was like an overflow on Twitter, I uh, I thought I would kind of give it a chance and at least um, look at the documentation. And the example you see here is uh, from the front page. And what I instantly started thinking was, this is this is interesting because you're not writing CSS properties. You're just writing class names, which kind of means that it's an abstraction over what you normally do in CSS. Just like we build libraries, uh, we create abstractions over difficult parts of the browser APIs to make it uh, better, more consistent, and more predictable. Uh, but they were just using class names for this. Um, and what they're specifically doing is that they're creating atomic class names, meaning that each class name represents a single CSS rule. And uh, so I found that really interesting. And, and through experience, I've had a really hard time working with designers to talk about how do we transfer the, the design into actual like technical CSS properties. And we don't speak the same language at all. Um, but with this abstraction, you kind of get into this world where you start to talk, you can start talking about the same thing with designers, kind of like they typically talk about tokens. And you could say that these are kind of like tokens. Anyways, Tailwind CSS is super successful and uh, there has to be like something to, to learn from this. Uh, but how would it kind of look like in uh, the world I come from, which is like React and CSS and JS and, and stuff like that. And, and maybe we could find some ways to, to improve the approach. Now, when I get these uh, inspirations and ideas, I never <laughs> really go on the web and search for someone else. Like, has anyone else done this before? Because if I do that, I get discouraged and I don't execute on that idea or inspiration. Um, so I completely ignore that. I didn't even read all the documentation of Tailwind CSS. I just went straight ahead on an idea. Uh, so the first iteration of Stitches uh, was called Tailwind CSS class names. And what I wanted to do there was basically improve the IntelliSense because uh, I didn't know that uh, Stitches had, uh, sorry, that Tailwind CSS had an uh, an extension for VS Code that gave you IntelliSense. But no matter, that IntelliSense is limited to uh, operating on the class name prop, uh, like in React, because it has to understand that these strings represent class names. So that's the only way it can know that. If you were to create a variable with some random Tailwind CSS class name, it wouldn't be able to help you. Uh, also, because of this, there's like no good way to do composition. You have to put everything into the class name property. Um, like uh, Tailwind CSS has some uh, separate system with configuration and compilation and stuff to, to do this and create new types of class names. Um, but yeah, I wanted this to just work in JavaScript. 
So what I did is I created this library called Tailwind CSS class names, and I took the, uh, the class names library, if you're familiar with that. It's basically just a function that allows you to compose together class names. Um, so I ex uh, exported that as TW, but it's literally calling the class names function. The only thing I did was to type it. So now calling that uh, function, uh, the IntelliSense will give you the class names um, of Tailwind CSS. Uh, what this also gives out of the box is composition. So as you can see in this example, you might have a container uh, and then you want a red container where you compose in the container and you add red 500, for example. So um, that kind of came out of the box. Um, and this is actually a library that's maintained now by someone else uh, and is being used by by some developers. So already here, like there's some value here. And I wanted to explain how the typing works. Uh, so basically all, every single class name in Tailwind CSS is a type. And you can see this T classes uh, type that kind of composes them all together. And then we have this T Tailwind string type. And that's basically, even though calling TW returns a string, we don't want to type it as a string. And the reason is that you can have one TW function and the return result of that you use in another TW function. Uh, but we want to give errors when you give a random string to the TW function. We only want you to pass in um, class names from Tailwind CSS or another composition. Any random string gives an error. Um, so by um, uh, giving this specific string as a return type, uh, we are able to put that in as one of the valid arguments to TW alongside all the other class names, null undefined, the object syntax that comes from class names, uh, the class names library itself. And then we just uh, create that type, we export it, and the class name property of React is happy because it, it just needs a string. It doesn't matter if it's like typed as a specific string, as we can see here. Um, so yeah. Uh, this gives a really nice typing uh, and intelligence experience. But there is a, uh, an issue with this approach, and that is uh, with Tailwind CSS, you have something called CSS purging. So when you insert your class names into the class name uh, property of React, the purging is able to look at all these class name properties, uh, figure out what class names you're actually using, and remove what you're not using from the CSS file, uh, minimizing the bundle size. As far as I know, uh, you can't really do that uh, when you just put it into JavaScript like this. So there was no way to like handle that. Uh, so I woke up one morning uh, with another idea, uh, and that became iteration two called Classy UI. And basically that idea was to use a bubble plugin to just go through your files and produce a CSS file on the fly based on, uh, on, on the definition you had created. But I wanted it to be a low level implementation so that I didn't have to map all the class names into the CSS rules they were supposed to produce. So rather like a low level API where you could build uh, Tailwind CSS on top of that. Also wanted to improve the IntelliSense a little bit instead of having like one giant list of, of class names, um, it could be improved. And also uh, some specificity issues, which we'll get back to. But to do this, I had to call my brother in arms, uh, Fabrice. He's the go-to guy for me when I have to deal with um, stuff I don't understand. In this case, bubble plugins and ASTs, abstract syntax trees. Um, so yeah, um, he, he joined the project at this point. Now to, to figure out how we wanted to express this, we kind of looked at the anatomy of a utility as they call it in, in Tailwind CSS, where they kind of prefix with an optional pseudo, which is hover disabled uh, or whatever. And then they have like a custom CSS property, uh, P representing padding. And then they have like a value or a theme as they call it. Um, so the value kind of comes from the theme. Um, so what we did is that we explicitly called it an atom instead. And we said that the CSS prop is first, then you have a token representing a value for that CSS prop, and then you could add the pseudo uh, after that. 
so to make this uh, work, we have to map these uh, tokens to uh, CSS properties. So for example, um, we wanted to you to define some colors and then these colors map to different CSS properties being color, border color, background color, and so on. Uh, and there's someone who has actually done some work on this. There's a project called System UI. Um, system, yeah, I believe it's System UI, which um, is like an open project where people collaborate to create these categories of tokens uh, and what CSS properties they should map to. So you would just go in and uh, configure the project. You would insert um, the tokens representing a value, and then you will be able to use these tokens on the different CSS properties. So this is how uh, it will be expressed with class UI. You import tokens and compose from uh, the library, and then you would compose these tokens together. Uh, in terms of IntelliSense, you now have, you point to tokens, you dot, you get a list of CSS properties, you choose a CSS property, you dot, you get a list of, uh, of tokens, which is a really nice experience. Uh, and in this case, we're adding a background color of gray 20 and a color of red uh, 50. What's kind of cool, I guess, about this is that it doesn't actually run this at runtime. The bubble plugin um, goes in and converts this into uh, actual class names. And then it uses the syntax to figure out how to write the rule. So in this case, you can see that it knows that it needs to write a background color with whatever value is behind gray 20 and the same for color. So it's not actually running uh, anything. Uh, in terms of pseudos, as we talked about, um, you were able to now put that behind the token. And this syntax looks a little bit weird, right? But since we're not actually going to run this, we had a lot of freedom. I would say in retrospect, too much freedom in the syntax because we just needed to read the syntax uh, off, uh, from, from the bubble plugin and then convert it into something um, that was actually run at runtime. Uh, what's uh, what's kind of interesting was because we wanted to be able to build a Tailwind CSS on top of this, we introduced custom uh, utilities so that you could, for example, add like a padding X thing that used uh, the space tokens and then map that to like uh, padding left and padding, uh, padding right, for example. Uh, what we also introduced here uh, was taken from Tailwind CSS, which was a concept called screens. Uh, and basically, you just uh, define a media query, and we wanted to do it as dynamically as possible. So you just create a function that re returns a media query, and then you insert at what position in this string do we insert the rules for that screen. Um, so. Uh, the way you would use these screens is, is that they would become imports. Uh, so in this case, you can import tablet and it worked just like the compose, but now they would actually be inserted inside a media query. Uh, what we also realize here is that these tokens are really great for theming. So typically you think about theming as having a bunch of values that you consume inside your style definitions. But we think of theming as overriding tokens. And what's really cool about that is that we can look at these tokens and we can convert them into CSS variables. And then when you define a theme, you override some tokens, meaning you override some CSS variables. So when you trigger the theme, it's just a CSS operation. There's no re-rendering or providing new props or anything like that. It's just a simple switch for the CSS engine. So that was uh, really cool. Um, but there was uh, a specificity issue here. Um, so this is, is a simple example of that. Imagine that um, in the style sheet, we have like P4 with padding 2 rem and P6 with padding 3 rem. And then we insert uh, class names on an element here. And uh, as you would intuitively think here is that since we have P4 last, it should trigger padding 2 rem, but it doesn't do that because P6 is defined last in the style sheet, and then that, uh, uh, then it wins. And I actually didn't know this going into this. 
uh, and it's completely unintuitive. Uh, there's probably a good reason for it working like this, but it's really, really um, annoying <laughs> and uh, very, very tricky to solve um, if you want to solve it inside the style sheet. So we needed to, um, to find like a way to, to handle this. And the way we handled it is that um, if you were to have, an, uh, have a base button, as you can see here, with a background color gray 20 and a color of red 50, then you wanted to create a button composition where you use the base button and you rather want to add the color blue 50. Now, the problem is that blue 50 might have been used in a different composition and been, been injected into the style sheet uh, before red 50 which means that when we now we would now introduce both the class name for red 50 and blue 50 we would end up with red 50 which is not what you want but what we are able to do is actually uh, look at uh, css properties and we know that okay you have two colors here blue 50 is the last color let's just remove the class name of red 50 and that's basically uh, what classy ui does it allows you to do these compositions, but it understands what you have composed. And then it removes um, uh, the same group of CSS properties so that you always end up with the last one. Um, but yeah, then we had a little chat with Max Stoiber, who's the uh, creator of DAO components, but there's like lots of people working on that now. And uh, we talked about uh, classy UI and we were very honest about it being like experimental and what didn't work very well. And what didn't work very well was that you had to install the bubble plugin, set it up um, in your build tools. And sometimes that's a little bit tricky, for example, in like Next.js and, um, and, and like Gatsby and, and stuff like that. Uh, and we did some crazy stuff. Like based on our configuration, we would produce the typing when the bubble plugin ran, meaning that VS Code didn't always pick up the changes in your configuration when you restarted. Uh, when you built the project, we actually built the CSS file from the bubble plugin, plugin meaning that we wrote the CSS file when the bubble process, process exited, which was at different points in time in different build uh, solutions, which just caused a lot of headache. Uh, but then um, uh, Max asked us, like, well, why don't you take this stuff and put it into CSS and JS? Uh, and I think I was a little bit defensive because um, we had put so much effort into this and wanted to, like, uh, explore some other things. But it didn't take long. And I was kind of like, yeah, why don't we put it into CSS and JS? Uh, and then Stitches was born, the core package of Stitches. And what uh, we wanted to do here was to move it into CSS and JS. We wanted to keep it atomic. Um, so instead of um, creating one class name per definition, we created a class name per unique CSS property value, pseudo, um, and so on. But we wanted to keep all the cool stuff we had figured out uh, or like experienced like tokens, screens, custom CSS properties, and the way we did theming. We wanted to keep all of that. Um, so the API of Stitches uh, requires you to create an instance because you have to pass in like what tokens are you going to use? What screens are you going to use? Are you going, uh, do you have some custom utilities? And uh, based on this, you're able to create a theme and it works the same way. You override the tokens and you get the class name back, where, which you can insert wherever you want on any element. And the elements that are children of that element will then be themed by the CSS engine. There's no re-rendering or anything like that. Um, yes, so um, the initial API uh, we created was heavily inspired by Classy UI. So, um, with class UI, you had this compose and you had the tokens. So we kind of continued that, but uh, you rather in, imported um, the CSS instance where you composed by calling CSS properties as functions, because now it's like properly in JavaScript and it's actually running in the runtime. And you will pass in um, 
the tokens or like the value for that property. Um, and if you were going to do like pseudos and selectors and stuff, you would pass that as a second argument. And this was actually uh, pretty nice. It was a really nice experience, especially related to um, IntelliSense, because you kind of dotted into everything. And whenever you like dotted or called uh, the CSS property, you would always the IntelliSense would al always pop up at the right time, and it felt really nice. Um, yes, uh, what we also needed to oh, did I jump skip on? Uh, yes, sorry. Uh, so to handle the screens, we introduced, as you can see uh, on the, um, the last one here, uh, a property. Uh, so like you could uh, point to the screen as a property. So in this case, CSS.tablet.color, which kind of removed the grouping behavior. Uh, so I'm not sure why we did that, but yeah, we'll get back to that. Uh, we had to test if our approach um, made any sense in terms of performance. Like, was this uh, slower or faster or like the same? Uh, so we did some uh, initial uh, benchmarking and we were happy to see that we were even like in the first iteration, we were a little bit faster than even emotion. Um, but like, this doesn't matter. Like emotion and all the others are perfectly fast enough, but it was more to see, are we slower? But we weren't slower, and that was really encouraging. Um, but yeah, um, the functional API we had, even though it gave like a really nice IntelliSense experience, uh, it wasn't like, it wasn't familiar, and that's okay. I completely understand that. So we decided to, to turn it into object syntax uh, so basically it will feel more familiar for, for new people. And the nice thing is now we have our screens back as a grouping uh, type of API where the property in this case is tablet and then you will be able to uh, define uh, underneath there. But what's important here is that every single property here results in a unique class name. Um, it's not like one single class. Cool. Uh, and then we got into a fourth iteration because we wanted to try this on uh, as a styled API. How would that look like? Uh, and uh, looking at the latest trends, we wanted it to be polymorphic, meaning we wanted to have the as prop. Um, and uh, I had also been looking into how these styled APIs allows you to consume props inside their definitions. And like, I don't like that. There's something fishy about it for me. Um, one thing being that you have this function making it dynamic. So whenever the, um, whenever the, the style component is touched, it needs to re-render to like re-evaluate that function. Uh, but more so the, the thing with the props leaking into the underlying element in the DOM. Like there are ways to handle this, but there's no consensus on this is the way we should handle this, which makes me think that maybe this isn't such a good idea. Um, so uh, I was thinking about a way to kind of uh, replace props with something else. And then um, I got contacted by Pedro uh, from this uh, startup called Modules. Um, and he had some um, thoughts on like variants and really wanted to see a variance API. So I thought th this, uh, this is perfect because this kind of uh, meets with uh, or aligns with my thoughts. So um, we wanted to replace props with variants. Okay, so the, the styled API looks uh, as you would expect. You can like point to an element and then you pass in a definition just like the core package uh, we went through. But then you have this second argument and this second argument are the variants. So in this case, we have two different variants, one of them called variant and the other one called size. 
and then a, uh, then you can pass a value to the variant, like activate a variant. In this case, a muted variant or a small or large size. And then you have like the CSS definition behind it. Now, the really good thing is that this is completely static, meaning that there's no re-evaluation of this. It, it runs it once and then it's ready to go. The way you would consume this is that these variants are of course exposed as props. Um, meaning that in this case, we, we want uh, the variant muted uh, if it's disabled, for example. What we also allow you to do is to pass in an object where you actually get the configured screens uh, and you can activate different variants on different screens. Uh, the really cool thing is that you, you can't get into any issues with uh, passing props, um, like the wrong props down to the underlying elements because we know what are the variant props, meaning we can um, remove them from the props before passing the rest of the props down to the underlying uh, element. Uh, what I also like about this, uh, arguably, is that you kind of, it, you have the static parts in your uh, styling, and then you have the dynamic parts where you consume the component, where you actually have your props. Uh, and your state and, and all this stuff. You, you, you do it in the component. You don't have to jump into the style definition to understand how these different props actually affect the styling. Um, they are kind of being decoupled, which I think is a really good thing, not just performance-wise but and uh, props leaking, but just as a concept. Uh, so we had to do some benchmarking on this as well. Again, not to like say that we're faster than anyone, but see how our approach actually affects the performance. This is not to say that style components is slow in any way. Like if it was too slow, people wouldn't use it. So that's not the point of this. The point is just when we define unique uh, definitions or like style components. So every style component has like a unique, it needs to produce a new class name. Um, then it's like the, the same, a little bit faster. But if we are to define the same properties uh, on the style component definitions, then it suddenly gets insanely faster. And that's the thing about the atomic approach is like the CSS properties of your application throughout all your style components are they usually the same or are they different? And they are usually the same because that's what it means to do a great design. You want to constrain um, the way things look into like specific spacings, sizes, colors, and stuff like that. So it, it makes a ton of sense. And that's like the definition part of it. Then it's like, uh, how fast is it when you consume like a static definition, meaning you don't have a function in your definition. Uh, it's about the same. And if you consume a dynamic, meaning that in style components, you would have a, a function. In stitches, you would have a variant. It's like a little bit faster. But again, this is not about, this was more to see if it's slower or faster, kind of to prove our point. And then we're here at the last iteration, uh, iteration five. And that iteration is basically um, that the repo has been transferred to modules, which I mentioned is a startup that's building a really, really cool service. And they have some ideas on, on how to, to help their um, customers and users to, to build like epic uh, styling of projects. Uh, and I'm like super excited to to see where where they take this uh, take this project. Um, so, what my point of this talk is: um, whenever you get an idea or an inspiration, don't go on the web and see if anyone's done it before. Just go straight ahead and do something with it. Like the worst thing that can happen is that someone has done it before but then you have actually learned something, which is always great. But sometimes you do something a little bit differently or maybe very differently, like you have a completely novel idea, and then that can become something really cool. And so I just want to say, keep reinventing and thanks for listening to my talk and have a great day. 
Hello again, everyone. And Christian, that was an amazing talk. I had seen Stitches before and I really, really like it. And yeah, let's have Christian here and look at it. It looks so fancy. Hello, you look really fancy. No. I don't think I've ever Thank seen you, you yeah. white. And I see you on stand up every day. <laughs> yeah, I'm at the birthday party today with my with my daughter. So uh, yeah, I'm an hour uh, late. Um, you know the time zones. So uh, yeah, the plans didn't go exactly as it was supposed to, but we're making the best out of it. But that that yeah. explains the shirt. Yeah. That explains, yeah, that exp I mean, I've never looked back, man, I don't know, honestly. To be honest, I've never went to a kid's birthday party ever since I'm an adult, I think, so. Okay, so what yeah. I want to ask you is, first of all, really good job on this. And I want to ask you, do you have any plans for this? Like, I know you have a full-time job because I'm there, but in general, like, do you have any plans to improve the library? Do you have any features planned out, stuff like that? Yeah, so what's happening now is that... Um, it's the modules startup that has taken over the, the project. Um, but I've been working closely with them because uh, from my perspective, like I'm, I don't know like styling and design and like doing CSS, I'm really bad at it. Um, so I don't have like an intuition for what's needed in the API. This has been more of a technical journey, uh, but the people over at modules, they have like, they know this stuff. Um, and it just was a coincidence that the stuff I've been working on here technically, technically uh, fitted very well with what they wanted to be the next step in doing like styling. Um, yeah. So yeah, so I've been working closely uh, with them, um, helping out where I can, give advice on technical stuff. And when they um, ask for certain API changes, um, I try to uh, navigate that with TypeScript, uh, which can be a challenge. Um, but yeah, it, it's a lot of fun working with them. And I think there's going to be some announcement um, next week. Um, but yeah, if you follow, uh, I mentioned Pedro in the talk. If you follow yeah, Pedro, yeah, do, he, do. he yeah, kind of... They do really good work. Yeah. Yeah, they do a yeah. lot of good work in the design system spectrum of things. Yeah, it's really interesting because it's 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 kind of crazy. This, uh, mm -hmm. if you think about CSS um, uh, as a language, um, it's kind of low level. It's kind of it, it might be seem a bit silly to say that CSS is low level because it, in terms of programming languages, it's high level. But this is what we do. This is how we progress. We create abstractions. Um, yeah, and uh, yeah. So uh, it's going to be super interesting to to see kind of the whole branding and the documentation and everything uh, coming together i'm super excited oh damn it's gonna get you branding that's sad okay cool uh uh well, i actually do have a question which is how is the choose doing in browser support like does it support ie 11 or only edge does it break on safari like everything um currently it's um Currently, it doesn't support i11 due to uh, proxy usage, but we don't have to use the proxy uh, technically. So it's possible to make it work for i11, but at its current state, it's just not been prioritized. But yes, yeah. I'm very confident that it will. Yeah, I think it's also kind of used for a tool in the browser that would also not support i11 right now, so it doesn't make a lot of sense. So yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. So my, my final question for you. No, 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 continue. Do you have anything else to say? Oh, I was just going to say, like if you think about the style components API, you say like style.div, style.span. Mm -hmm. You can't implement all the elements as methods. Uh, so you use a proxy to yeah. to yeah to handle that. Uh, but that doesn't work in IE11. So what you would do there is that you don't have this dot div dot span type of thing. You rather call it, and then you pass the element type as the first argument as a string. Uh, so that that is something you would have to do on IE11 if you were going to support that. Yeah. So that sounds like it would make the complexity of writing new updates harder, and it would also make the bundle quite bigger, probably. Yeah. With just like a, you know, yeah. a huge JSON of different things that you can add, like different elements. So my last question is, and this is a joke question, does your daughter think you're famous? Uh, I guess she, no, no, <laughs> not at all. I try to tell her, you know, dad is famous. You know that, don't you? No, 
but I, I she, doesn't believe you, she? <laughs> she doesn't believe you. <laughs> yeah, my my girlfriend doesn't believe me either. I'm telling her I have my own YouTube. And she speaks English. <laughs> so like... <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> well, seriously, I'm not, I don't consider myself famous. I have like one. I'm lucky if I have one person watching my morning streams these days. So. Uh, I mean, you yeah. need to understand, Christian, that we do not all wake up at 8 a.m. If you were <laughs> well, streams you at 11, <laughs> I would watch them all. <laughs> yeah. I don't sometimes I, I don't wake up to go to play. <laughs> uh, life yeah, is hard, I want Christian. To life you. is hard in the morning, uh, Christian, and you don't appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> I think for That's now true. we're out of questions. So if anyone has any questions in the next 30 seconds, please post it in the QA. Otherwise, we are going to move on and go to the panel in a bit. So I see that no one is typing. I'm using my my wife's like monitor, so it's like fucking huge curved monitor, and I can have everything like Slack, WhatsApp, everything is here. And yeah, thank you so much, Christian. And I'll literally see you in five minutes, or maybe even less. So cool. yeah, thank you so much. For sure. <laughs>